Brew Strong is brought to you by Blickman Engineering, home of the top tier brewing stand. Visit them online at BlickmanEngineering.com. <laughs> Sisters. Greetings, greetings. I had to try it, John. I had to try it. I don't blame you. <laughs> Special thrill, I know. I've done it, you know, in my off time. Well, and I, I've never realized how energizing your, your intro music is. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to listen to that a little more. It's really good. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been pretty solid for, what, 10 years now? That's Something like that. And I have no intention of changing it on you guys. There we go. <laughs> well, I'm Justin Crosley, uh, and of course, my friend John Palmer here. I am filling in for the great Jamil Zainashef, um, who is taking care of his health. He's having a few health issues, um, kind of a long-term thing for the poor guy. So um, it's been going on for a little while, and, and he just needed— We do want to emphasize that this is not STD-related. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a y- y- Palmer's right. Um, that's if we were talking about me, you know, there there there'd be <laughs> there'd be some doubt to that statement. Um, uh, no, he just you know he's got a, honestly it's a it's a very rare uh, disease. It is not terminal. Don't worry, folks. Um, it, but it takes a long time to treat, and and he just needs a little break. So um, I offered to step in and give Palmer a hand so that we can keep Bruce Strong coming. Very good. Yeah. Uh, okay. And on today's program, we've got a special guest. I'm excited about this topic, um, and I, I think everybody's going to be. And we're speaking to Aaron Justice from Ballast Point Brewing Company. Welcome, Aaron. Hey. Uh, glad to be here. Thanks so much for taking the time. Um, yeah, save my ass. <laughs> I, I, I get to skip out on work and uh, talk to you guys, so uh, this is this is great. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> we should have planned two shows, John. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, listen, I'm going to let you guys take this, but, um, you know, Aaron is 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 with Ballast Point and has been doing some very interesting research that John Palmer came across. And, um, and so, John, why don't you tell us how you came across this information, and then Aaron can tell us about what he's doing there. Okay. Well, Aaron and I have been friends for several years now. Um, I teach uh, one – I do one lecture at his uh, brewing class down at UCSD. And we've done some uh, different experiments over the years. But this particular one is something that he had done uh, on his own, or at least, you know, as, as part of uh, normal work at Ballast Point. And um, Aaron, why don't you explain to, to the viewer, the listeners, what, what it is that uh, you experimented on? Uh, yeah, I, usually when we're working together, we're doing water related stuff. And uh, right. I still want to kind of keep going with that eventually but uh yeah i i kind of got sidetracked uh with this ibu thing because um you know at ballast point we when we're growing uh you know this is several years ago uh we're doubling in size every year and all of a sudden brand to brand consistency uh became a priority right and so you know we we would have weekly uh meetings with our with our quality team, and we would go over uh, critical beer specs, you know the the big ones, uh, right? Gravity, pH, SRM, IBU, and if there were any red flags, uh, we'd just kind of discuss what happened and how to fix that problem. And uh, so, w- w- with this one in, in particular, uh, I I, rem- I distinctly remember one time we were sitting in the office and. Uh, you know, we, we were off of, of, uh, on IBUs by about, uh, it was like 20 or something like that. And, uh, 
uh, one of the analysts looked at me and he, he said, hey, you know, hey, uh, so w what happened? <laughs> and and uh, to be honest, I, I, I didn't have an answer to him because, you know, I, I understand Brunel's calculations and calculating IBUs and, uh, you know, and how they can be lost throughout the brewing process. But to have a concrete answer about how much is gained from each hop addition, hot side uh, and or cold side, uh, I didn't have that answer. So that started this whole project, which we were collecting data for, for two years. Wow. Uh, uh, on, on multiple locations to, to really see uh, what the heck is going on. <laughs> yeah, understand better where in the process you gain IBUs and lose IBUs. Absolutely. Towards your target. Yeah. Well, and I think I think with, with this one, and well, even to just backtrack just a little bit, uh, you know, when you have a staff of brewers, mistakes happen, and you know, sometimes they forget a 60-minute addition. They they didn't even realize they did, and uh, so yeah, if, if we don't have any data to show, okay, well, if, if we're off by 10 IBUs, well, uh, chances are uh, he or she missed the whirlpool addition. Uh, then we could actually fix that problem as opposed to just kind of guessing. Sure. Yep. Well, what's amazing, to, first of all, this sounds like a daunting task. I'm, I'm not surprised that you, you've had to collect data for a couple of years. But I am a little surprised that this information isn't out there. I mean, I imagine Ballas is not the first brewery to run across this issue in the in the history of brewing. Uh, that, that's an excellent point, and uh, that's kind of why I wanted to share this information, mm -hmm. uh, because most of the studies that I've seen, uh, you know, they, they, they go into depth with HPLC, but it's usually uh, beers, uh, how do I put this, uh, they're all lager beers. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, so yeah, they're not, right, yeah. They're not this wide variety of beer styles uh, and or ones that are heavily hopped and heavily dry hopped. Got it. Okay. And I'm going to do this throughout the show because I'm that guy. But can you <laughs> can you explain HBLC to me? Oh my gosh, you know, I I I'm drawing a blank of what those letters stand for. Palmer, High do you remember? Liquid chromatography. There you go. Thank you, John. <laughs> John always the <laughs> See, that's why John and I are friends. Or it might be high pressure. I'm not sure. Uh, I think it's high performance. I think that sounds right. So okay. do, does that describe a device that measures or a process? It is a, it's both. Okay, got it. Yeah, so you, you have this, this piece of equipment and you have a standard to run uh, and then a technique and uh, away you go. Got it, okay. And it, it, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a brewer first. Uh, <laughs> I guess I... I I'm, I'm a meteorologist, so I, I have a science background. So at least I understand a lot of the, the science. But once we start getting into uh, super analytics, uh, I always defer to our lab team, who are the, the nerdiest of nerds. Uh, okay. I'm, a, I'm a huge brewing nerd. They take nerd nerddom to the, to the next level. <laughs> right, just, right. just like my friend John here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, wait. Now I can't let this go by. You're a you're a meteorologist turned brewer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I I was so I I got my meteorology degree. Uh, I got into television. I was in television for almost 13 years. Uh, so I was a, I was a TV meteorologist, and uh, I was a home brewer at, uh, during that entire time. And I decided that uh, brewing was way cooler than television. <laughs> so you you were the guy in front of the green screen, uh, you know, uh, showing me the weather patterns. That that was me. That's so cool. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I love this, uh, but brewing's more fun. So I get I, it. I I cannot over. Don't get me wrong. I had fun in broadcasts. I mean, there yeah. are a lot of crazy stories. Okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, beer. Uh, I mean. You can't you, you you can't compare. Right. Yeah. Make, making beer for a living and being involved with beer is the coolest thing. Period. I I can't I couldn't agree more. Um, but I will say you know I have a longer format show here on the Brewing Network called the Session, and I think I'm going to have to have you back so I can hear some of these crazy stories too. 
talk. <laughs> hey, I, I, I'm always available. Excellent. Especially right in the middle of the day when I'm supposed <laughs> to be working. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, well, let me do this. I, I need to get us to a break. Um, but the first thing I want to do is make sure I understand what we're, what we're talking about here. And so essentially, you're just having these discrepancies, uh, particularly in IBUs, from what you were calculating they should be. And then when you measure the beer at the, at the final product, you're finding them to be quite different. And your, your study was to figure out exactly where, when, why, and how those discrepancies are happening. I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah, there is a black box, you know, from adding hops in the kettle to finished product, and we just wanted to, uh, to clarify it. Got Track it. it all the way through. Okay, perfect. Then I'm going to get us to a very quick break, and when we come back, we'll dive into this. Uh, but first, Palmer, uh, we should be thanking John Blickman for bringing us Brew Strong, shouldn't we? Oh, indeed, yes. <laughs> He's been sponsoring this show for a number of years now. Yeah. And uh, couldn't do it without him. You know what? It doesn't matter how much I screw up or what awful things Jamil says. He just won't drop us. That's right. <laughs> He's a true, true friend that way. He is. Go to BlickmanEngineering.com and learn about all the amazing uh, products that, that John engineers over there. John and his team are a great group of people, and uh, they, they blow my mind every time. I'm looking forward to seeing their booth at HomebrewCon this year, as, yeah. I, as I always am, because he's always unveiling something crazy. So, yeah. Well, in fact, we're going to have the new Anvil Foundry all-in-one uh, system. Oh. If you're familiar with the Grainfather and Robobrew, yeah, it's a similar system, but uh, made even easier by being Blickman. I'm excited about that because you know we're about to give away the official Brewing Network um, More Beer Brew Sculpture. We're gonna uh -huh. we're gonna give it away to a lucky listener. It used to be Jamil's, and then and then it became the Brewing Networks, and now we're gonna give that away. So I might be in the market for a new all-in-one brew kit, man. There you go. I'll have to go check it out. Uh, all right. Thank you to John Blickman, and we will be right back on Brew Strong with Aaron Justice. Hang in there.
for Jamil. It's Justin here, and we've got John Palmer and uh, Aaron Justice from Ballast Point on the line with us. And uh, as mentioned before the break, we are talking about an enormous research project that Aaron took on to figure out why discrepancies in IBU inputs are happening um, uh, and in the final product. So, um, Palmer, do you want to give us a quick definition of IBU for everyone out there so we can move on with this? Sure. Yeah, well, um, the IBU, International Bitterness Unit, um, it's based on a spectrophotometric test, um, ASBC number 23, I believe, I believe. And what they do is they take a sample of beer, um, add a solvent to it, do a solvent extraction. And so now you have this extraction of bitter stuff that they've pulled from the beer. And then they shine a, a light through it of a specific wavelength, 275 nanometers. And they measure the absorption or how much, how much of that light is absorbed by the sample. And then they take that number and multiply it by 50, and that's your IBU. And that is the standard test that's been in place since the 1950s uh, that everybody uses around the world. And what it measures is this extracted bitter stuff that is chemically similar to um, isoalpha acids, you know, the, the main bittering in, uh, ingredient in beer, um, but is not... It, it also includes a lot of other things. It includes the beta acids, the unisomerized alpha acids, oxidized alpha acids, um, tannins, um, a whole bunch of different chemical compounds that are, you know, similar to isoalpha, but in some cases are actually not bitter. Got it. So there's a whole lot else going on in there, and, and, and it's not as accurate as we want it to be? Is that kind of what's happening? Well, yeah, that's part of it. Um, the Like I say, the test has been in use since the 1950s, and it is the industry standard test. So when we talk about you know a beer being 60 IBUs or 70 IBUs or whatever, uh, or in the case of American Light Lager, only 15 IBUs, we're referring to this test specifically. Um, and it, again, it's based on we're estimating how bitter a beer is by measuring this, this um, absorption of supposedly bitter stuff. Now, as we've moved from um, over the years from you know, bittering additions only, you know, you know, hour long boils and so on, mm -hmm. no dry hopping, et cetera. Back in back then, the the test was pretty good. I mean, there was there wasn't a whole lot else in the mix, so um, it was a pretty good correlation, you know, uh, test to perceive bitterness. But now that we're now that we're dealing with more, I guess, flavor and aroma additions, and maybe even more flavorful and aroma driven hops themselves, there's right. there's an entire portion of this perceived bitterness or bitterness itself that is not encap encapsulated by this measurement. Well, and actually it's almost the other way around. Okay. The the test is capturing all of the non-bitter stuff that comes from hops as well. I see. And so you're you're capturing um aroma or it's, it's a hop flavor and aroma as well um to some degree and um we are getting we're for the same amount of bitter stuff where we have a lower portion of um, say isomerized alpha acids because we're doing more late addition hopping and so on. I see. So it is there, there we have kind of lost uh, the, the same correlation that we used to have with the IBU. Um, it doesn't mean that the IBU is invalid um, it just we just kind of have to recalibrate ourselves on what the IBU is telling us, what this IBU test is telling us. And so as we talk through um, Aaron's experiments or his his data collection, um, it's important to understand that you know he is sampling the wort and the beer throughout the process, measuring this absorption of bitter stuff, which, you know, as actually very 
varied in chemistry. It's not just iso alpha acids. Got it. Okay, so Aaron, where do you want to start to help us understand, uh, well, where you began and how you went through this? Uh, boy, yeah, where, where did we begin? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we wanted to start with the, the very beginning. And we, we have certain brands that um, had mashups. So we decided to, uh, to see if mashups add bitterness to beer. And I, I, a lot of people... I tell you, this was a, a very heated debate in the brewery because a lot of people, uh, you know, thought that uh, mash ops don't add bitterness, but uh, uh, they absolutely do. So uh, we we uh, decided to uh, take those beers, and once we collected all the wort into the kettle, uh, we would take a sample. And this is for all of our hot side sampling that we did. Uh, we'd take a sample, we'd cool that sample down, uh, centrifuge it down to get all the particulate out, uh, and immediately analyze it. Um, and uh, we found that that you know mash mash hops did add uh, a, you know a certain amount of IBU uh, to beer. Uh, in fact, we were getting anywhere from eight to ten uh, percent utilization. Uh, from those hops, uh, so yeah. it, 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 and I think that surprises a lot of people. Uh, I was not surprised just because I knew that, you know, uh, if it's sitting in a mash ton at 150 or or above, especially by the end of louder, uh, you got to get something out of there. Yeah. So uh, let me let me ask this question, Aaron. So when you're doing this, you you. You start your mash. You put in put in your mash hops. Um, you finish the mash. Do you then uh, take the uh, the beer through fermentate the boil and fermentation with no other hop additions? Unfortunately, no. So and that that was the tough part because this specific IPA has a lot of hot side additions and and is dry hopped. So really, uh, we so you. So you were saying, okay, we're we're doing these boil additions or other additions. We're accounting for that, and this difference then must must be due to the mash hopping. So yeah, we we pulled a sample before we started adding any hops. Okay. Uh, to see what we extracted from those mash hops, and we we did a control where we didn't add mash hops. And um, the the funny thing is with with these uh, you know these uh, like what you're talking about with these IBU measurements, uh. Even the control would still pull up like one or two IBUs just from sure. mold. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that, that's just the nature of the game. I, I you know, I remember reaching out to uh, John Paul May from uh, from Hopsteiner, uh, and he said, you know, uh, about 90% of the bittering that comes from IBUs is from uh, uh, ice alpha acid, alpha acid, and humulinone. Uh But then there's that whole other 10% uh, of who knows what. Uh, yeah. And and when we when we were doing these these experiments, we uh, we found that we could get bitterness from or, uh, bitter orange peel, from cinnamon, uh, and various other spices would also throw in, uh, you know, some IBUs into our measurements. Sure, they would be in the tests would interpret these other compounds as being bitter stuff similar to iso alpha and and so on. Absolutely, and okay. specifically, uh, specifically our pumpkin beer. Uh, I was like, uh, boy, is our pumpkin beer really 40 IBU? I, I don't think so. Uh, that I think that you know the, the spices we're adding uh, uh, quite a bit to to our measurements, uh, but the perceived bitterness was not there. Wow. Well, so there's all of these factors, but then you also have to account for all the other standard factors of adding bitterness too. Like there's so many variables, right? Like even just uh, boil time, gravity. Uh, you know, I know you're talking about just starting with mash hopping here, but as you go on, like what form the hop is in, there's, a, there's just hundreds of variables. And I, I think that's a, that's a good point. And, um, you know, the ones that we focused on, because, it, you know, you can go through the list and, you know, uh, boil time, uh, work gravity, hop rate, uh, yeah, uh, what what kind of hop product are you using? Pellets? Are you using extract? Are you using a uh, whole cone? 
uh, pH, how fresh are the hops, uh, what kind of kettle are you using? I mean, uh, it is, but I, when we did the study, it was very clear which ones had the biggest impacts. And really it became uh, work gravity, uh, a boil time or contact time, mm -hmm. uh, hop rate, and uh, the other one was uh, uh, the saturation point. Yeah, um, you use use so many hops. I mean, you once you start getting up to near about 100 IBU, uh, you really aren't going to extract that much more out of those hops. Wow. No, so putting in more longer boil time, nothing really changed once you reached that 100 IBU threshold. Uh, we we would get uh, uh, IPAs that could get to uh, at, at knockout. We could get uh, I think one IPA had almost 129 IBUs. Okay, wow. Uh, so you can you can do it, but that that's a very heavily hopped beer. Um, and interestingly, for that one specifically, uh, almost half those IBUs were lost during fermentation. <laughs> So interesting. Okay. So it, it didn't all of a sudden drop back down to the sixties. And that's, that's really, when we were doing the study, we were thinking, what the heck is going on? How, how do we get a knockout of 129 IBUs when our target is 70? Uh, right. and, and then lo and behold, we would hit our target of 70. So, you know, a lot of times we were hitting these targets just because we had brewed these beers so often, mm. uh, and we were, we would hit our targets, but we didn't really understand why understand why and now now all of a sudden this kind of uh enlightened us if you will <laughs> sure yeah. so yeah. what what was the utilization in in mash hopping you know compared to to boil hopping so that the brewers who are kind of saying no i, I don't believe in this but you know w what did you find uh we, we were getting anything anything of as low as eight percent to um uh as high as eleven percent and I, I i will say that we decided to use two different hops at different alpha to see if we would get more IBUs with the high alpha hops, which we did. Hmm. Uh, we also used a different hop rate for each hop. So one was Palisade and we hopped at, uh, I think it was like a half pound per barrel versus a pound per barrel. Uh, and the more hops we use, uh, the less utilization, uh, utilization we got. And that, that's gonna be kind of a trend uh, going forward is this hop rate. You know, and, and when you're using these these high hopped IPAs, the more hops you use, the less utiliz utilization you're going to get. It, it, there is a direct correlation. Yeah, and I think that's one of the most interesting aspects of this study, is you know the the fact that hopping rate and hop IBU saturation are such big factors in you know in what we eventually achieve. And as well as you know, uh, the calculations that we normally do when we try to calculate how many IBUs we're going to get. I, I think uh, yeah, that's a great point. And uh, I, we, when we were doing this, we had an IPA that um, the Whirlpool hops, and this this is an old recipe, but the Whirlpool hops were about 0.1 pounds per barrel, uh, which is not a lot. Um, versus another one had a pound per barrel, so it had 10 times as much hops. In the whirlpool, but this other one uh, was more bitter. Uh, so mm. even though it had such a low hop rate in the whirlpool, its utilization was terrible. Whereas yeah. the other one had a better utilization. So we realized right there that uh, the the saturation point thing is, is a real thing. Yeah, that uh, we will we'll talk more about that later. I think. Um, I want to interject here for our listeners that um, in terms of hop rate, um, when we talk about pounds per barrel, uh, just for, for uh, comparison's sake, one pound per barrel is about four grams per liter in terms of hopping and is also equal to about a half an ounce per gallon. So as we, you know, as our listeners try to uh, understand this unit in terms of their own brewing, uh, one pound per barrel is about four grams per liter, is about a half ounce per gallon. I think that's good. That, that'll definitely help people, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So, John, do you want to move on to, to now what happens in the boil or cover some more uh, just of the, of the variables that were, are still happening in for factors for bitterness? Well, I, th I think we've covered the the basics, and I think as we talk about boil hopping, um, we'll 
talk about more of these these factors and what are relevant here versus mash hopping versus whirlpool. Um, but I think you know just to recap, um, the standard factors for bitterness: um, boil time or contact time, uh, boil temperature, wort gravity, um, then the hopping rate and the saturation point. Saturation point being about 100 IBUs. Maybe it's 107, maybe it's 110, maybe it depends a little bit on the particular wort or system that you're using, but you know, somewhere around 100 IBUs does seem to be a plateau in terms of getting more, you know, more IBU into a beer. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I, I absolutely. Okay. So yeah, um, and the final point on mash hopping, I think, which I think is interesting, is that um, you know you're you're putting hops in the mash and only getting about eight to ten, eight to eleven percent utilization out of that you know quantity versus say forty percent or more util utilization from a boil addition. And let's talk about boil additions now. Okay. This this one was interesting for sure. <laughs> the the um, the first thing that we we wanted to see was how quickly we were getting our bitterness from those those kettle additions, and uh, we we found out that within five to ten minutes we were getting most of our IBUs out of the hops that we added, and I, I think yeah. that was another real big shocker for us. Uh, we were not expecting that. Yeah, that and that was really surprising to me too. Um, but I think in light of the test, it can be, uh, you know, put in perspective. So what we're saying is that five, you know, ten minutes into the boil, you've done this addition. Um, a lot of the extractable material from the hops is coming out into solution, and is being registered in the test. Right. Yep. Okay, so in this uh, extracted material are, you know, unisomerized alpha acids. Um, then you have your oxidized alpha acids, which are also bitter, but only about two thirds as bitter as an isomerized alpha acid. And then as that boil proceeds, you're going to get uh, more and more isomerization happening. And so I think. Um, let's say at, at 10 minutes, we've got 80% of the total soluble hop extract into the boil. But as that boil proceeds, you're gonna get about another, say 20% of soluble hop extract into the boil, as well as increasing the proportion of isoalpha that's going to be part of that IBU measurement. Would that be correct? I think that's fair enough. I, 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 I know that, you know, uh, I guess the real question would be how soluble is alpha acid? Uh, and that's something I, I, I know that it's not as soluble as iso alpha acid, but um, I, I've never known like the true solubility factor for yeah. alpha acid. And that's why we, we would love to do HPLC because then you could see each compound uh, right. changing. And, and I, I even said this when I gave the, the talk at the Brew Summit. Uh, I think I even talked about it in the paper, but uh, you know this IBU measurement is more of like a, a an X-ray, uh, whereas uh, HPLC is more of like a CAT scan, where the X-ray is yeah. very fuzzy and you can at least get the picture, but the CAT scan is going to really tell you what's going on. Yeah, that's a very good analogy. Um, yeah, I was talking to uh, Val Peacock about this, um, about your paper and so on. Val, of course, being a, a hop ex expert from uh, from formerly from Anheuser-Busch, and yeah. uh, he agreed that um, the IBU test, the spectrophotometric test, uh, does um, extract the unisomerized alpha as well as other hop and beer compounds, again, that are soluble in the solvent that they use for the test. So there is that 10% uh, that's other, other unrelated, you know, material that you mentioned, um, as well as, I think, unisomerized alpha um, that would be captured in that test. 
And so, yeah, with an HPLC done in tandem with this, we probably would see an increasing proportion of ISO uh, throughout the boil. It would be really cool to, to see the an individual analogs. So uh, yeah. obviously you have, you know, humulone, uh, ISO cohumulone, uh, ISO ad humulone, and, and yeah, see how rapidly each one of those analogs gets picked up and, and lost. Uh, if I ever have another two years to, to, to do this, that would be really cool. But uh, <laughs> holy smokes, that, that would be a very cool study to read. Yeah, it would. So well, can I you ask know. you guys from a from a sensory standpoint, if I'm understanding this right, if if most of this, you know, if 80 percent of the IBUs are happening within the first 10 minutes and then the other 20 percent happens over time, does this reinforce the um, philosophy that late hopping um, provides less of a sharp bitterness or firm bitterness than early hopping? Do you, do you think this correlates with that at all? I think so. Um, but I think, the, again, the reason is that late hopping, you aren't getting the isomerized alpha, which is you know the, the king of bitterness, mm. if you will. Mm -hmm. um, you're getting more of the oxidized alpha, the, the humulinones, as they're called. Um, and those are only about two-thirds as bitter as uh, isoalpha. So... Um, yeah, le le you are getting bitterness, but it's from a different compound than the isoalpha. Okay. And, uh, and polyphenols too, uh, yep. even though polyphenols, uh, a lot of them like xanthohumol don't really register on the IBU. Um, they definitely enhance perceived bitterness and, and the longer you boil, uh, hops, you're going to extract that vet, uh, those polyphenols out of that vegetal matter. So I, I can only imagine that also will add to uh, an astringency that can uh, be perceived as bitterness as well. Okay, got it. I like that your study is starting to explain some of these things for us too. We've been talking about this on the show for years, this whole late hopping thing. Jamil, uh, you know, introduced it to me and many others, and then and now it's just sort of the standard, right? So it's it's nice for me to understand kind of what's happening uh, with that process. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Now, Aaron, you had mentioned um, the the hopping rate and how. I think I think it was what table was that in the paper? It's table two? No, table one. Um, basically, if I read this correctly, that you were getting um, at a lower hopping rate, you know, less pounds per barrel, but higher alpha. You were getting better utilization than using a lower alpha hop at a higher rate. It is, you know, more pounds per barrel. I, I think that's. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, we we saw how hop rate had such a a big impact on utilization. So we we have the luxury because we were brewing four four brews into one fermenter. We could just kind of blend it all together. So we decided to change the hop rate. Uh, we the target uh, IBU was 40 for this beer, and uh, so we we did we we took a, a high alpha um, hop Polaris, uh, then we took a couple medium range hops uh, Northern Brewer and Palisade, and then we used Tetanang on the fourth brew. Uh, so Polaris has 17.6 percent alpha acid, whereas Tetanang has 1.9. Wow. So you know the the Polaris because you know we're targeting the same uh, uh, alpha charge uh, yeah. for this beer, but the Polaris was uh, the hop rate was 0.1 pounds per barrel, whereas the Tetanang was 1.2 pounds per barrel. So 12 times as much hops were thrown in, and the utilization uh, dropped dramatically. So the Polaris, the the utilization was 45% uh, utilization. Uh, the Tetanang was uh, about 31%. So I, yeah. I think that just that that vegetal matter, the the the, the tube, uh, takes away from your utilization. Uh, yeah. I can only imagine that the iso alpha acid uh, it adheres to uh, th uh, surface areas. Yeah. So if you increase the surface area, uh, in other words, uh, particulate, it's going to take away from your your 
your bitterness. Yeah, and we should uh, define utilization again real quickly. Um, so utilization is basically the, the uh, let's see, the, the measured IBUs, I wrote this down when I read it, the measured IBUs divided by the amount of uh, alpha acids in grams per liter that you put into the beer. So um, is, is that, I believe that's, yep. what did I do with that? Yeah, so like, it, like uh, uh, to, to, tech, to calculate your alpha charge, uh, it's just like a, an IBU uh, calculation. So you have your weight times the percent alpha acid uh, over a volume, and then you just convert that to milligrams per liter or, right. or, or PPM, parts per million. Right. Yeah. And then compare that to with the actual uh, IBUs that you measured from the beer. How much how much of that alpha then was realized in the beer? And that's your percent utilization that we're talking about. Uh, indeed. Okay. Good. Just to catch everybody up. That is good. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Whenever I say alpha charge, it is uh, the, the, the total amount that we should have got uh, theoretically, but obviously you're never going to get, you know, 100% of all that alpha out of those hops. Right. Right. That makes sense to you, Justin? It does. Uh, believe it or not, it does. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm, I, what I'm thinking is um, that, that hop sellers don't want to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> this, guy, <laughs> this this less is more situation that Aaron has found, <laughs> you know. Um, but hop sellers love love craft brewers though because we uh, we've introduced uh, the the four pound per barrel dry hops. Right, so, uh, right. <laughs> you've you've more than made up for it with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hop growers, whenever I go up to hop harvest, uh, absolutely love us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you're you're right though. Uh, I, a lot of people, uh, when you're talking about recipes, and they say, "Oh yeah, you know, it doesn't matter what hop you use, you know, you can substitute any any hop for a 60 minute addition because when you boil it, you kind of remove all the the aroma and flavor from that hop." But mm. uh, I, I caution you that uh, you need to watch for those alphas. You know, so if you're going to substitute a hop for a 60 minute boil, make sure that it's a similar alpha. Otherwise, you're going to get uh, a better utilization or worse utilization. Uh, depending on what the alpha is on those hops. Got it. Good point. And Palmer, it, uh, I'm glad. Well, Aaron, I'm glad that you 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 wrapped it up by explaining why you think that happens, and it, with the surface area and and the vegetal matter, you know, alphas, you know, clinging to that and and dropping out in the true. Because as you were describing it, I'm just thinking, well, how is that possible? I don't understand. And and that makes sense, you know. And and that, that's something that we're going to see. Uh, uh, with the whirlpool as well, the, okay. the vegetal matter had a, a, an incredible impact on utilization. Okay. Well, why don't we do this, Palmer? If it's all right with you, we'll take another quick break, and when we come back, we can we can talk more about this and and whirlpool hopping. Excellent. Okay. Very good. Hang in there. We are talking with Aaron Justice from uh, Ballast Point Brewing Company, and um, Aaron, can I uh, am I able to link to this paper when we post this show? I. It's on the NBAA uh, website, which requires a um, membership. NBA membership. Got uh, it. NBAA membership. Well, then a little plug for the NBAA, who does good work, and, and John's doing some great work for them, too. Uh, you professional brewers out there, if you want access to this, go uh, go on over to the NBAA website and get yourself a membership so you can read more about this. Uh, in the meantime, hang in there. Uh, this is Bruce Strong, and we will be right back. <laughs>
two guys that know how to turn beer into beer. This is Brew Strong. Well, the other two guys here know how to turn beer into beer. You're uh, <laughs> you're tuned into Brew Strong. I'm Justin Crosby filling in for Jamil Zanishef today. Uh, and, of course, we're here with the great John Palmer and Aaron Justice from Ballast Point Brewing Company. And we're talking about uh, IBU discrepancies and, and the research project that Aaron has been uh, working on for the past uh, couple years of his life. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, John, do we need to cover more about what is happening in the boil, or are we ready to move on to the, the next phase? Well, I think uh, one question I had for Aaron is, um, you know, in view of the significant impact of hopping rate and saturation point, you know, in realizing uh, IBUs into the beer, finished beer, um, how do you think uh, original gravity or, you know, the, the word gravity uh, factor compares to those two? Where do you think they rank? It, it looks... Um... I guess it depends on what type of beer you're brewing because uh, we kind of noticed this, that the lower gravity beers, that there was really not a strong correlation. And, and I read a paper uh, about it, uh, and they also found the same thing, that anything uh, below roughly 13 Plato. Uh, okay. 1052. Uh, yeah, 1052. Uh, there really wasn't that strong of a correlation between utilization and gravity. But once you started getting above 1052 or 13 Plato, you start to see a steady decrease uh, in, in utilization. And I don't, I don't know if that's just because, uh, just because it's density, you know, just mm -hmm. because it's more dense uh, that you're, you know, anything's going to be less soluble in a more dense fluid. Yeah. Uh, or it could be a combination of things that there's uh, just just more true uh, in yeah. the kettle. So, uh, but we did see that you know the super high gravity beers, you start to see a pretty rapid decrease in utilization as well. So I, I think when you're talking about kettle kettle hopping, the the, the big ones, uh, and and you know the old calculations used to be just work gravity and time. Uh -huh. But I, th I think you do have to factor in also hop rate and saturation. And I think that hop rate and saturation uh, may have a bigger impact than, than all the rest. Okay. It's interesting if you, if you use uh, the, the standard Tinseth model, um, uh, one pound per barrel, uh, if you assume 10% alpha acids and a 60-minute boil, um, that works out to about 100 IBUs when you calculate it out. So, yeah, uh, just kind of interesting that those the way that those numbers, typical numbers, kind of calculate out. Yeah, and I I think that's uh, for us we we as we were going through this this study, uh, the the end game was to come up with a, a predictive model uh, to predict what was happening in our brewery as you know more sophisticated model which. Uh, I'm guessing we'll be talking about uh, here later, but uh, right, yeah. But kettle, kettle, uh, kettle addition, at least for for uh, the equation that I use, it's work gravity, time, and uh, and hop rate. Okay. Um, and saturation, I didn't work into there just because it was it's kind of hard uh, to kind of figure that out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, whereas you know, uh, when you go into whirlpool. You kind of have this known IBU, or at least target IBU that you're going to have at the whirlpool. So, in okay. other words, it's still a work in progress. <laughs> yes. Well, of course, of course. Okay. Well, let's talk about whirlpool hopping then. Um, so, you, you saw the same sorts of trends then that you saw during uh, boil hopping in terms of, you know, the the rapid increase in in measured IBUs. We did. I. Uh, you know, when we pump uh, to the whirlpool, we pump at a, a at a high velocity. So you're talking about uh, 60 barrels of wort going into the whirlpool. 60 barrels, uh, one one barrel is 30 31 gallons. So uh, you can do the math wow. right there. It's a lot. Yeah. Um, so uh, we usually pump over to the whirlpool in about 20 minutes. Uh, all that fluid. So 
in order to create a uh, very strong circulation. Uh -huh. Once it's all pumped over to the whirlpool, we drop the hops in. Okay. And allow those hops to, to settle down for 20 minutes, uh, and then we knock out to the fermenter. Okay. So uh, there's. Oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, sorry, I was just kind of summarizing. So there's like a 20 minute, a nominal 20 minute contact time between the the hops and the hot wort. There is, and and then during knockout to fermenter, uh, usually we take uh, anywhere from 40 minutes to to almost an hour. So total contact time for for our whirlpool hops mm -hmm. uh, was about 80 minutes, roughly. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, but we were getting all of our IBUs again in the first five to 10 minutes. So, uh, and, and then not only that, but uh, as the hops were sitting in the whirlpool, uh, we really didn't gain that much more uh, bitterness. And I, I can only guess because uh, A, the temperature is dropping in the whirlpool. Uh, I will say though that uh, the thermal mass in our whirlpool was pretty high. So it stayed pretty hot uh, during knockout. But there's that factor, and also uh, all the hops settled to the bottom, uh, so you're not getting this this rigorous mixing mm, yeah. of hops uh, th that you get during boiling. Okay. Now, when you say uh, bitterness in that context, are you talking strictly about the the ASPC measurement, or are are you talking perceived bitterness? Uh, that's a good question, and uh, it, I just what we measured, so the measured IBU. Okay. Um, and, and I would love to do a, uh, an, an experiment where we could uh, actually do some sensory to this. But, um, you know, uh, so for kettle uh, additions, we were getting on, on average 44% uh, utilization. Uh, for Whirlpool, uh, we were getting almost 30% uh, utilization, uh, okay. which is uh, significant to say the least. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, again, what were we getting? Is it uh, a it's co it's a combination of you know alpha acid, humulinone, and and iso alpha acid. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah, of that thirty percent utilization, you know, maybe more isomerization is occurring with time over that eighty minutes. You know, although at a reduced rate because you're at a lower temperature, but uh, yeah, but still very interesting and nicely. The interesting thing about whirlpool hopping is that. I think you get a proportionally greater uh, contribution of bitterness from the uh, the oxy alpha, the humulinones, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just go with humulinone, and uh, <laughs> maybe that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's but, it's uh, yeah we. So the thing is that with these these whirlpool additions, once we found this out, we started making a, a lot of IPAs with uh, Whirlpool only additions. Uh, we didn't want to add any uh, bitterness uh, up front uh, on the 60 minute edition because we realized that we were getting plenty uh, from the uh -huh. Whirlpool. Uh, our Scottish Ale, uh, you know, we put a little bit of Whirlpool addition to Fuggle and our Scottish Ale and uh, the hop rate is super low as you can imagine. Uh, but we were getting 44% utilization in the Whirlpool uh, wow. for our Scottish Ale. So uh, it makes a difference. Versus our Imperial Red, which was you know a pound per barrel in the Whirlpool, uh, it's already a super bitter beer, or, or it was bitter wort going into the Whirlpool. Uh, the utilization was dreadful. Uh, the utilization was 10%. Wow. Uh, yeah. You know, it's a high gravity, highly hopped uh, beer that we threw a ton of hops in into the Whirlpool, so the hop rate was just outrageous, and it had the lowest utilization at 10%. Yeah. That's very interesting, and I, I think that it's that kind of uh, data and understanding that really will benefit you know a lot of commercial brewers. I mean, understanding you know, where to spend their money on hop additions. It is, and you know, going back to even uh, 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 our, our our hop friends up in Yakima, I it allows them to to say, hey, you know, um, if you're really worried about uh, utilization um, and you're not brewing IPA, uh, maybe you do want to use kettle extract Yeah. Uh, because yeah, you remove all, almost all vegetal matter with kettle extract. Uh, so util utilization is going to be uh, significantly more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, it's uh, like I say, 
everything we did with this study was, was eye-opening for us, and we, we, we knew that we had to share this with people uh, because it, it would just be a shame if we just kept it to ourselves. Uh, that what, what is that going to do for the beer, beer community? Uh, you know, we, we're all here to, to make better beer. That's kind of the mantra of the NBAA, and that's, that's why I wanted to share it uh, yeah, exactly. with, with the NBAA. I love this. Absolutely. And uh, I will give a second plug to our friends up in Yakima, um, good friends of the show, Yakima Chief Hops, uh, YCH up there. And um, I, I think that's an excellent point, that if you're dealing with all this vegetal matter, um, I think brewers really should try some of these new products that you can use, these hop uh, extracts. So um, They are there to, to, to help you out to achieve the goals that you want. Yeah. So they, they come up with these things to, to, uh, to, to make you a better brewer, to do what you want to do mm -hmm. and allow you to be uh, creative. So uh, there's a lot of truth to that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Now, are you seeing the saturation barrier, that, that 100 IBU saturation as well in, in the Whirlpool? Is that oh, yeah. And when it goes back to the calculation uh, for, for Whirlpool, I remove time. You know, whatever you're going to get uh, out of those hops, uh, you're going to get. Uh, so time really is just not a factor with Whirlpool hops. And instead, I inject uh, the IBU saturation uh, variable into the equation. So for Whirlpool, when you're calculating out Whirlpool, at least for me, uh, we do gravity, hop rate, and IBU saturation. Okay. Got it. But it, it was, uh, you know, if, if you're going at a pound per barrel hop rate in the Whirlpool, uh, you're going to get like an 18% utilization uh, if, if you're going for a light one, uh, it's going to be uh, much more than that. It's going to be double that. Wow. Okay. Well, before we go into your models uh, some more, Aaron, let's talk a little bit about uh, the losses that occur during fermentation. I, I think that's super important. And this one was uh, – this was a big factor as well. And, and this helps us to, to, to achieve our goal of uh, hitting our target IBUs is understanding uh, what the heck goes on in the fermenter uh, once you knock out into that fermenter. And we found that uh, our beers, on average, were losing 33% uh, of their IBUs within the first two days of fermentation. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, if, if you think about this, uh, you know, the cell growth, you know, during those first two days is, oh, yeah. you know, exponential. So you have this you know, huge biomass of yeast cells uh, in your fermenter, and the isoalpha acids and other bittering compounds are, again, sticking to the exterior of those, those cells, and, uh, and, and you're getting a loss of IBUs. And we found that it, it depends on um, what yeast strain you use on how big of a loss you're going to get. If you're going to have a non-flocculent yeast strain, in other words, one that stays in suspension, uh, for instance, uh, ones that we saw with uh, high IBU loss were the Sactois from White Labs and um, the uh, uh, Whitbeer yeast strain. Okay. Uh, These we, are low we, flocculating ones, huh? Yeah, the, uh, low flocculating. Uh, did, I, did I say high? I, I meant low. Okay. Uh, but yeah, low, low flocculating uh, yeast strains. Uh, definitely we saw losses closer to you know, 40, 50%. Okay. Now, to clarify this a little bit, no pun intended. Um, nice. <laughs> so a, a low flocculating yeast strain stays in solution longer, probably picks up more of the, the hop compounds. And then when you do filter it out, then you're taking away more of the, the alpha and bitterness, the IBUs, with it uh, compared to a control. Indeed. Is that right? Okay. And, and filtration, we were seeing uh, a further IBU loss of about 5 to uh, about 12% uh, oh. of, of, our, uh, uh, of, of our bitterness or our measured IBUs. So filtration definitely removes uh, bitterness as well. We, we also saw that... Um, if, if, if you're at a uh, high Krausen and, and uh, 
you see the tank blowing off and, and, and you know, there's just yeast all over the floor. Uh, we would get, uh, it's, it's hard to quantify, but we were lo losing a lot of IBUs through that. Oh, okay. uh, we, we use anafoam uh, because uh, that, that equates to beer loss. Yeah. Uh, if you have, you know, just an overflowing fermenter, uh, you're, you're literally seeing thousands of dollars go down the drain. Okay. Uh, so, so we use anafoam and that helps to kind of control uh, IBU so that we're not getting a, a loss during fermentation, but still, uh, it, it is, it's, it's, it's significant. And, uh, uh, the gravity, the, the OG of the beer, uh, if it's a bigger beer, uh, the biomass is going to be bigger, yeah. uh, at the end. So there's gonna be more yeast cells, uh, and a longer fermentation and a more vigorous uh, fermentation. So you're also going to get a bigger loss with bigger beers. Makes sense. Yes. Okay. So really across the entire brewing process, it, I, I just keep hearing that um, kind of surface area and biomass has one of the biggest effects on everything that you were able to measure. It does. Uh, and, and, I, I, that actually you summarized it really nicely <laughs> because it, it, it is. Uh, yeah, if, it, if it's not the vegetal matter or trube in the kettle or the whirlpool, then uh, it's the same thing when um, you're fer uh, you see fermentation, yeah. uh, filtration. Uh, that's all surface area. Anything that, that, can, that the beer can run across, uh, you're going to just be losing those isoalpha acid and other bittering compounds. So... Yeah, it's it's just it's it's a very uh, complex uh, model for sure. Yeah, well, but especially if I can understand it, it's both complex and rather simple. Like these, the, the principle of of uh, alpha acids and other compounds sticking to things and dropping out in any way they can is is actually quite simple. It, the complex part is understanding every single place that that could happen, right? True. And, and, you know, I, I forgot to add uh, dry hopping. You're throwing hops in there. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're going to have, again, a, a loss because of that vegetal matter. Now, it depends on how much you dry hop, though, mm. because if, if you start getting into two pounds per barrel, three pounds per barrel, four pounds per barrel, we saw an increase in IBUs, uh, a significant increase in IBUs. Uh, so when we're doing our hazy uh, IPAs and we're we're double dry hopping and going up to almost four pounds per barrel, uh, we 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 had one beer where we did not add any hot side hops. We just did a dry hop only beer. Uh, we went four pounds per barrel of Centennial. Uh, we're just having fun because uh, I don't know. Uh, but uh, the finishing IBU of that beer was uh, was almost 43, just from dry hopping. Wow. Now, you know. Luckily, there's been a lot of studies about this, uh, and it, it can be almost safe to say that most of that comes from uh, humulinone as opposed to, of course, isoalpha acid, uh, because you have to boil work to get isoalpha acid. Yeah. Got it. That's impressive. Cool. Well, uh, John, I don't think we have to take a third break if it's all right with you, because we, you know, we can— Okay. Um, I guess what I'm wondering, and, and, and this, I guess, could bring us into uh, the model that you guys ended up with or, or, or what other breweries can do, but in the end, did you solve the problem, for lack of a, of a better phrase? Were you able to come up now with a way to accurately measure what the, re the resulting IBUs were going to be and answer your colleague or your boss, I don't know who it was, when he came in and said, what the hell happened? Why were we 20 IBUs <laughs> off? <laughs> were you able to uh, uh, formulate a model to, to do this? Uh, it, absolutely. It, it's, it's, the, it's in my recipe spreadsheet that, uh, that I use now. And uh, you know, every brewery is going to be unique. Uh, so it, it's not oh, going to be perfect. You know, if, if, you know, if you're home brewing, you're going to have uh, your own gains and losses. Uh, if, if, it's, if it's a five barrel system, uh, I will say that we uh, at our R and D five barrel system, we we saw the sim similar gains and losses. And as big as a 150 barrel brew house at our main production facility, we were seeing similar. So, uh, so far so good. 
Uh, we brewed at our Scripps Ranch facility 36 different types of beer. Uh, lots of them were one-offs. And we applied the model. And uh, we were hitting our IBUs within five uh, almost every time. Wow. So uh, I, all the work actually wasn't for, for nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's <laughs> really I, impressive. I, I, was, I, was, I was pestering our lab. Uh, all the time to the point where uh, I, I actually they were they were they were always uh, very good uh, throughout this whole process. They they like I say they loved geeking out, but man, it, it was a lot of work. It sounds very like it. Cool. So, yeah. So your your model that you have in the paper, which is titled "Tracking IBU Through the Brewing Process: The Quest for Consistency," it's in volume fifty five, number three of the Master Brewer's Technical Quarterly Journal. Um, so your model then is really determining your percent utilization based on your brewery and your equipment and then these factors for like contact time, um, hopping rate, and so on, right? It is. And okay. what we do is then target a knockout uh, IBU. So again, uh, we, we have uh, our kettle hops, uh, which we use gravity, time, and hop rate to calculate uh, the IBU pickup from our kettle hops, yeah. uh, plus the, the Whirlpool edition, which is uh, gravity, hop rate, and uh, IBU saturation. So those are treated separately. Uh, and then we hit our target at knockout to the fermenter and when if it's a if, if it's a first time brew, I I usually just assume that there's going to be about thirty three percent loss. Okay. Uh, and then we just see what happens. I mean, a lot of times, uh, uh, if you brew enough, you know that uh, a lot of what you do is just trial and error. Yeah. Uh, and if you have the luxury of being able to send in samples uh, to a lab, uh, you can do this. You you can easily do this. You can. Uh, take out your take your knockout samples, see what IBUs you're getting, and uh, see how much you're losing through through what you do for processes. If you don't filter, uh, then your losses aren't going to be as bad. I mean, a lot of our beers aren't filtered, uh, for instance, our hazies. Uh, but uh, then you can just you can probably just adjust the equation to your your brew system, and. Uh, I think now we're we're starting to get a better picture of what what's really going on, and uh, I would love for to see uh, further studies to see uh, even more more data. More data is always better than than less. So right, right. Uh, and and doing more sophisticated analysis, uh, HPLC, and see like what are the specific ones that are being gained and lost, uh, which compounds. So yeah. It's gonna be fun, and it, it really helps uh, as a brewer for me to to formulate recipes. Like I say, uh, after doing this, a lot of our beers now are just whirlpool and only bittering hops uh, for bitterness. Uh, we started just doing dry hop only beers uh, because we know that we get bitterness from from dry hopping. Wow. So, uh, you know, from that standpoint, uh, it allows creativity. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. and th that really resulted in enormous changes. Those are not uh, those are not insignificant changes that you ended up making. So no, yeah, uh, and I, I think it's it, it's kind of uh, you know uh, like I say like Dr. May, uh, you know he he's studying this more to see how it affects Northeast IPAs and hmm. and these humulinones and and uh, so on and so forth. So he's he's really charging ahead. To, to see uh, what what's going on in that fermenter, and he's doing a really good job. That's great. Well, and I just want to take a moment to uh, mention one of our sponsors, since you because you brought up you know that obviously more people should should do this and and really collect data, get your beer analyzed, you know, based on what you calculated the IBUs and and then what they ended up being. And for you homebrewers out there, you might think that you don't have access to that, but actually White Labs has and I'm pretty sure they still do it. They have a what they call Big QC Day every year and uh, yeah. homebrewers and pro brewers alike are able to send in samples of their beer for all sorts of different measurements. 
Um, so if you're looking for more data on your beer, just like Aaron always is, you homebrewers have an option for that too. Just go check out our friends over at whitelabs.com. We, uh, for the longest time, we're using White Labs. So professional brewers also uh, use White Labs. Uh, once we've got to get all our fancy schmancy equipment, uh, uh, we still use them for, for certain things. And, and they are, they're a great resource for sure. They are. Yeah. Good people too. Um, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, what do you think, Palmer? Do we understand things better now? I think we do. <laughs> uh, we, we've made a pretty long show out of it, but I think it's uh, fascinating, fascinating work. Yeah, um, I agree. Really, really fills in a lot of the questions that everybody's had over the years. So, yeah, thank you very much, Aaron. <laughs> like I say, it's it's th this is stuff that I I always uh, was wondering when I was on the brew deck trying to figure it out. And it, it, it was so exciting to do this and, uh, you know, hats off to the brew team for collecting all the, all the data and our lab uh, team to analyze all of it. Um, like I say, we, 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 once we saw all this, it was, it was mind boggling and we had to share it with everyone. And it's, it, it, that's the fun part of, of being part of the beer community is sharing information. Yep. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better. Yeah. And by the way, I now understand why you really left the uh, uh, meteorologist world. You couldn't handle the uncertainty of weather, and uh, <laughs> it, it, you dove into something that you could study and become more certain about, I think. I, 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 I guess you could put it that way. I, I, uh, <laughs> there are other reasons, but we can talk about that some other time. Absolutely. But no, I, like I say, uh, t TV, was, TV was definitely fun. Um, yeah. yeah, beer, this is the thing about beer. Uh, with weather, you predict it, uh, but you can't drink it uh, at <laughs> yeah. the end of the day. So, you know, uh, well, I guess if it's raining. But, right. Even then I would worry about it, especially in California. Yeah, yeah, good point. But, uh, yeah, beer, the, the, the coolest thing about beer is that you, you sit here and you analyze and you do all this, and at the end of the day, you're drinking a beer. Yeah, yeah. Your beer that you made, which uh, – you know, come on. That's that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's about you know? as cool as it gets. And well, and and actually, truth be told, there seems to be the more we learn about beer, just as many variables in beer as there are in in any other scientific endeavor. Uh, so, yeah. but at least, like you said, you get to drink it while you're figuring it out. As far as you want to go down that rabbit hole, you can keep on going. <laughs> uh, it is. It is. It's. Beer's bigger than any one person. Right. You can't, you can't know it all. Yeah. And even when you start learning, you, you realize you start forgetting stuff that you learned uh, just, just a year ago. So, <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, we, which is humbling and, and awesome. Absolutely. All right, Aaron. Well, thanks again for being with us today and for all the good work you're doing for Better Beer. Hey, no problem. All right. John, should we get out of here? We should. All right. Very good. Uh, let's thank John Blickman one more time for bringing you this Brew Strong and every Brew Strong. Uh, go see him at Homebrew Con next month in June. I'm excited yep. about that. John, you're going to be there, right? I'll be there, yeah. Probably have to do some uh, Brew Strong shows live. Yeah. yeah. Get a bunch of get a bunch of listener questions. That's always fun. Absolutely. Uh, you can send your listener questions into brewstrong at thebrewingnetwork.com. Those go directly to Jamil and John Palmer and uh, in fact, uh, next up, we're going to be doing a Q&A show, and, and John's going to get through some of your questions today, right? That's right. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. This is Bruce Strong filling in for Jamil Zainashev. I'm Justin Crosley, and we'll see you next time.
was trying harder that time. Hey, howdy, hey, my Bruin brothers and sisters! <laughs> greetings, greetings. Oh, man. I don't know how he does it. I, I never never gave it much thought, but he's darn good at that intro. He is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you both are. Uh, I'm Justin Crosley filling in for Jamil Zanishef on Bruce Strong today. Um, he is taking care of some health issues, and we want him to get better. Uh, so he just needed some rest. Um, and and he agreed with John and I that the show must go on. So I'm just yep. helping out here uh, so that John and I can keep uh, getting you some Bruce Strong info. Very good, yeah. Yeah, it's good to be back, and uh should have a... Should have a good show today. We're going to do some questions and answers from the from the listenership. All yeah. right. Yeah, absolutely. We got some uh, questions and answers lined up. Uh, uh, by the way, you can always send your questions into Bruce Strong at thebrewingnetwork.com. And uh, John and Jamil do a, a, dar- a darn good job. They do try to get to every one of you. Um, just so you know, don't expect to email directly back. Sometimes that might happen, but most often we just do it here on the show. Uh, so send yeah. in your questions yeah. for that. Um, yeah, and uh, while we're at it, a big thanks to our, our wonderful sponsor here on Bruce Strong, who's been with us for so long, uh, Blickman Engineering and John Blickman. You can go to BlickmanEngineering.com. Um, and, and Palmer, you, you, we're working on some new projects with him. Yeah, yeah. We've been uh, doing the Anvil line for the last couple of years, yeah. and this is kind of the uh, mid-price point, you know, the Chevrolet compared to the Cadillac or the Blickman systems. Okay. Um, but it gives us a chance to, to get a little bit of more variety out there in terms of brewing equipment, and we've just introducing the Foundry brewing system. It's an all-in-one um, Green Father Robo Brew kind of thing. Um, but with a better user interface and uh, both um, three-gallon and five-gallon capacities, um, up to, I believe, 1070 original gravity, even 1075. So pretty nice system to wow. run on a 110 household current. That sounds awesome. Uh, are we going to see that at HomebrewCon? It'll be there at HomebrewCon. In fact, I think it's available now. Ah. But uh, you'll definitely see it at HomebrewCon. I love this. All right. I can't wait to check that out. You know, uh, at HomebrewCon, actually, uh, as always, we're having our Brewing Network anniversary party. Um, BNA 14. 14 years, Palmer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. I remember the first few. Those were fun. <laughs> and it ended up back at your house. And I... I was a victim of drunk Jenga almost. Oh, that's right. That's right. Those were the days. <laughs> Those were the days. Now I can't even recover from a night like that, John. I know, me either. <laughs> we're getting old. We are. <laughs> uh, but we are having our anniversary party out there. It's Saturday, June 29th. You can get tickets for it now at thebrewingnetwork.com. Um, and I encourage you to go. It's going to be a great time. We've teamed up with Melvin Brewing and More Beer to put on this party. Um, cool. And while we're there, the reason I'm bringing it up now is we're going to be raffling off, giving away our um, More Beer Brewing Network brew sculpture. Uh, and, and this thing has some history. Uh, you know, built, oh, yeah. it, it was one of the first built um, at, at More Beer and then uh, was given to Jamil, um, who I think retrofitted it or they retrofitted it for him a couple times. Then he passed it along to, to me and the Brewing Network. Uh, it's had some some professionals brew on it. Uh, Matt Matt Brinelson has brewed on that system, and yeah. um, Dan Gordon. And now we're we're giving it away to a Brewing Network listener because we want to keep the momentum of this thing going. We want to keep the tradition alive. Oh yeah, this is the this is the system that brewed many many of the. Uh, gold medal winning beers that are documented in brewing classic styles. You're right. You're uh, in fact, I can't believe I, f- I failed to mention that. You're absolutely right. Um, the bu- this system was really uh, behind that book, behind those yes. recipes. Uh, so it, it's really got a, a great pedigree, and um, we're gonna get it all cleaned up and and ready to pass along. So I might need a new system. I'm gonna have to check out this anvil. Yeah, check it out at anvilbrewing.com. There we go. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody out at HomebrewCon. And in the meantime, let's do some Q&A, shall we? All right. So this one came in from a listener, and I'm glad because I have the same questions. I've been having trouble wrapping my head around this, and it's about hop creep. Oh. Um, and Lister, listener writes in, uh, you know, I, I've heard this come up on the Brewing Network several times now, this topic, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around the issue surrounding hop creep. 
And he's got uh, three questions. So um, first, um, and I'll let you uh, tell us what hop creep is in a minute here, John. Well, it's the alter ego for Jamil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense, actually. I've se- I think I've seen that uh, alter ego. Uh, so first he asks, uh, what is happening with hop creep? Is it, is it sugars in the hop that are contributing to the creep? Or is it enzymes in the hops that break down long chain sugars, uh, longer chain sugars that are still unfermented in the wort, or maybe both? Yeah, uh, that that's a great question. And to the best of my knowledge, I think it, the majority of it comes from the enzymes in the hops um, acting on the dextrins that are in the beer after fermentation. So, um yeah, the the hops do have a small amount of sugars, um, but not I think not enough to account for the four gravity points up to one degree Plato of further attenuation that it can occur um, due to hop creep. And and that's essentially the the easy definition of what hop creep is, right? This yes, okay. It's a, it's a it's an increased attenuation, additional fermentation, if you will. Uh, of the beer when it's supposedly done due to dry hopping. Got it. Okay. And so, and we covered this on our new podcast, Hop and Brew School, which you can find here on the Brewing Network as well. Um, yep. And yeah, th- th- this point is interesting because it seems easy to think that if if this increase in Play-Doh is happening, you must be adding sugar, right? And so the the, the, right. I, the original theory, I guess, is, well, if we're putting hops in and this is happening, they must have sugar. But just so I'm clear, so in the mash, obviously, uh, I hope everybody knows by now, we have this enzymatic activity, um, which yep. uh, that the, the, those enzymes are in the grain. Um, and this happens in the mash, and it breaks down the sugars to, to turn them into fermentable, but it obviously doesn't break them all down. The longer chain sugars tend to stay intact. Uh, right. And, and there, are, there are ways to break those down. For example, Britannomyces is, is great, right, at, at breaking down some of these longer chain um, sugars. Right. But without the uh, use of, of an additional yeast, it, it sounds to me like what you're saying, John, is when we when we dry hop, when we put in these hops, rather than adding sugar, there are additional enzymes within the hops that are able to further break down the sugars in wort. Yes, and it, it's the uh, alpha glucosidase enzyme, the one that actually nips glucoses off the ends of the sugar chains. So, um, you know, going back to basic brewing theory. Um, the mash creates lots of maltose, a little bit of maltotriose, the three-chain sugar, and the maltotetriose, the four-chain sugar. The yeast only ferment the single, the glucose, the double, the maltose, and then to a small extent, depending on strain, the maltotriose, the three-sugar uh, sugar. So all the other uh, longer sugars are left behind in the beer, and those contribute to residual sweetness and beer flavor. Well, um, the hops, being plants, they have these amylase enzymes just like the barley does, Mm. Um, and one of them is this alpha-glucosidase that is opposed to beta amylase, which nips off a a maltose, a two-chain, or sorry, a a two-molecule sugar from the end of the chain, it nips off a single uh, sugar, glucose. And so this nibbling action uh, starts happening with dry hopping. Got it. Okay. Now, from there, uh, you, you may ask yourself, you know, why is this only happening now? Do you occasionally ask yourself that question? Well, <laughs> about uh, about almost everything in my life. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, because this must have been going on through all of the history of brewing, right? So why all of a sudden is it this hot topic? I guess. Yeah. Well, and I think there's a I think there's a couple reasons, and this is largely my own opinion from what I've read, um, but I have been interested in this topic um, with the increase in craft brewing and the increasing demand in in for hops with good oil levels um higher alpha and so on 
we've we started changing the kinds of hops we're using for dry hopping. Mm. That's step one. In our quest to get more oil from the hops and better hop flavor and aroma, um, we've started lowering the kilning temperatures that are used at the hop supplier when they process the hops, when they're drying them. They're lowering the, the kiln temperature to reduce the loss of the hop oils. You know, you get the as you're drying the hops and you're trying to you know force hot air through them. Hmm. Uh, you know, you would boil away or you know evaporate some of these hop oils. So they're they started lowering that temperature, and I think in doing so, they are not denaturing these leftover amylase enzymes uh, like they used to in previous decades. I see. Okay. So we're we're getting more we're getting more enzymes coming into the into the or staying with the dry hops and then of course we're doing more dry hopping than ever before you know up to four pounds per barrel instead of just one pound per barrel right and even a half pound per barrel you know 100 years ago was considered a lot sure so we're really increasing the amount of these enzymes in the wort in the in the finished wort beer actually uh in two ways uh both with the volume of hops that we're putting in and potentially the volume of enzymes that are left um, alive. Alive. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I think that's why we're seeing more of this. So then let me ask this too, and this was part of his, his question that was written in as well. Mm-hmm. I guess the short question is, so who cares? <laughs> like, so <laughs> what, if, if it's been happening and we know it happens and we know that the ABV could go up or, or you know, the, the gravity can go up, you know, why is that a problem, or are there additional problems like off flavors that we're seeing with this? Yeah, well, there, there, yeah, there's those are both uh, good good questions. We are seeing, we do see issues with the increased attenuation, the little extra boost in alcohol. Um, it's a small change, but depending on the state that a brewery may be in. Um, they may have trouble with their truth and labeling laws. Uh, you know, yeah. if, the, if the percent alcohol, the ABV changes by a tenth of a percent due to hop creep and they, you know, they have a different value on their label or in their official filing with the TTB, that could be an issue. Um, so, and that, and I, I'm not a legal expert by any means, so yeah. um, the degree of that issue is is beyond my knowledge. But that that, that potential Could issue be. is there. Yeah, yeah. Um, for the home brewer, for from a quality point of view, um, the very real issue that a lot of brewers ran into, and this I I started getting questions about this oh, about three four years ago. Um, brewer would email me and say, "Hey, you know, we're having." diacetyl problems with our beer. Um, we're making this IPA. We we do our VDK test. Once the VDK test comes back negative, we dry hop. When dry hopping's done, we cool it, package it, ship it out. And then like two weeks later, the customer calls up and said, hey, we've got diacetyl uh, in the beer. What's, what's, the, what's the story? Mm. And um, that, you know, for a while, puzzled me, but as we start understanding what diacetyl is um, and how it's formed, it becomes uh, it, it becomes clear. Uh, when you have hop creep, you're generating uh, small amounts of easily fermentable sugars, these glucoses. Mm. And uh, when you when you and when you dry hop, you're adding, a little bit of oxygen into the beer, you know, the, the hop pellets, you know, as you pour them in, a little bit of air gets carried into the beer as well. So now you've got active yeast, you've got some ferment- new fermentable sugar, and you've got a little bit of oxygen, a little bit of fermentation occurs. Unfortunately, um, from a brewer, brewer's point of view, uh, the yeast... Uh, they start to undergo a little bit of growth, you know, with this fermentation. But all of the amino acids that they depend on for, 
you know, resupplying their nutrients and their in their cell membranes and so on, those have all been used up in the main fermentation. Mm. So they use this new, little bit of oxygen that comes in to synthesize more amino acids that they need to further this growth. Well, uh, that synthesis generates a compound we call acetohydroxy acid as intermediary. And that is a waste product of the yeast and gets excreted into the beer in this case. Um, acetohydroxy acid is, like I say, it's a waste product. The yeast won't touch it. What, what happens then is that acetohydroxy acid chemically oxidizes into diacetyl or pentane dione, the other vicinal diketone. And that's a purely chemical process governed by temperature and pH. The warmer the temperature, the uh, lower the pH, the faster that acetohydroxy will oxidize, chemically oxidize, not actually oxidize, uh, into diacetyl. Once it's diacetyl, then the yeast can clean it up. When a IPA brewer is dry hopping, and then as soon as that, you know, that two or three day dry hopping window is done, they would cold crash the beer, get it ready to package, and what they would end up, end up doing is packaging lots of acetohydroxy acid. And as soon as that keg or bottle would warm up, then it would chemically convert to diacetyl, and they would have diacetyl in the package. Ah. So this is why this whole hop creep thing has really become an issue. It's it partly you know out percent alcohol TTB concern, but really more of a beer quality diacetyl problem. Sure. And just imagine how frustrating. I mean, brewers go through yeah. uh, painstakingly go through cleaning up their beer so that and and measuring diacetyl, and then finding it in the in the in the packaging later. Yeah. They're all going, what the hell? Right. And so, yeah, yeah. that's that's where this this issue is reared its head. And I, th I think that it go a lot of it goes back to these lower kiln temperatures that we they've been doing, trying to get more oil out of the hops. Okay. Okay. Um, well, and and th thank you for clearing that up for me. Um, and folks, like once again, just a little plug here for our, our other new show, Hop and Brew School podcast. There is a whole episode on that as well, where we talk to the folks from Yakima Chief Hops, and we, we cover this one in depth, uh, including yeah. some techniques at the end of the episode about how you might deal with this problem. So very good. Yeah, check that out. All right, John. How about this? Can we take a quick break? We'll come back and we'll do some more. Excellent. All right. Very good. Hang in there. You're listening to Bruce Strong, and we'll be right back with more of your questions and John Palmer's answers.
The two guys that know how to turn beer into beer. This is Brew Strong. Uh, a quick correction, that, that's one guy who knows how to turn beer into beer. <laughs> and that's, that's my friend John Palmer here. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for hanging with us. I'm filling in for Jamil Zanishev for a couple shows here while he takes care of himself and gets better. Uh, he's doing all right. Don't worry too much about Jamil. Uh, yep. Not an STD. Yep. <laughs> As well, he said that anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but he, he's going to be okay. And uh, actually, I talked to him today. I, it sounds like we might see him at HomebrewCon as well. Excellent. Yeah. yeah I hope he makes it. Yeah, me too. Um, well, in the meantime, uh, John and I are holding down the fort here uh, with a Q&A show. And uh, let's get to another one. All righty. So Sean writes in. Uh, he says, hey, guys, I am planning on diluting a beer with water. Um, and, and well, I don't know why you do that. Uh, and but he says, and I seem to remember some issue regarding calcium that I need to be aware of, but what was it? Does the water need more or less calcium than the beer has? What do you think, John? Um, calcium shouldn't be an issue. Um, <clears throat> why would you want to add calcium? Well, I guess if you are targeting a certain water profile, for your beer, um, and uh, when I talk about water adjustment, I talk about um, you know sulfate to chloride ratio. Um, talk about um, mineral structure as being two components of the seasoning uh, effect that the minerals and water can have on your beer. Um, so if you're gonna if you're going to dilute your beer to make it a lower ABV. Um, you might consider adding some additional calcium salt to the water uh, to kind of keep it, you know, same, same as before dilution in terms of that mouthfeel and that seasoning level. Um, but I, I don't think uh, calcium is so much of an issue if you're going to be diluting your beer as uh, oxygen. Um when you add, you know, water to a beer, um, you're adding roughly, you know, eight parts per million of oxygen to that beer as well, which can quickly cause it to go stale. Um, so at the very least, you should boil that water first. Now, a half hour boil, uh, or I mean, it doesn't have to be that long, may a good, you know, 10, 15 minutes will drive your oxygen levels out and reduce them to about one ppm, one part per million. Um, that still will end up uh, staling the beer in you know, three to four or five months, somewhere in that time frame, uh, if you don't keep the beer cool. And put that in perspective, a you know, commercial brewer is looking for you know, five to 10 parts per billion in terms of packaged oxygen in their beers. So uh, one PPM, you know, not ideal, um, but it's certainly better than the eight to 10 PPM that you would get if you didn't boil the water first. Got it. Okay, good advice. Okay. Here's one. Uh, now the, the email, the question is titled polyguile. But oh yeah, is it party guile? No, in this case we're talking poly. I don't. Oh, I've never heard of this one. What is poly okay. guile? Well, this is something that uh, our good friend John Blickman uh, and I cooked up uh, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually it's actually older than us. We didn't invent it, but okay. um, uh, Chris Colby talked about it in BYO a few years ago, um, and it actually goes back to the British practice of party guile brewing where you take a very large mash and divide it up between different beers the difference here is that you're at you're doing poly instead of party you know part, instead of partitioning we're actually mashing again mm, okay. and it's a good way it's a good method to build up high gravity worts for like barley wines and wee heavies and so on um what you do is you 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 know uh do a mash, you know, say 10 pounds of grain, you know, um, three to three or four to one uh, water to grist ratio, 
like you know two quarts per pound, two and a half quarts per pound, something like that. Um, you draw off that wort and hold it, and then you take another 10 pounds of grain and use that wort to mash it with not additional water, but you use that that first wort to uh, do the second mash. I see. And what happens is, is that you effectively double your work gravity that way. Okay. Um, there's the, the equations and tables are in the current edition of how to brew um, and that show you those relationships. But uh, yeah, John and I did an, you know, an experiment over the phone when I was working on the book that uh, verified all this. And we, had a, we have a Bruce Strong show on it too, I think the one we did uh, beginning of last year, uh, or maybe the previous year, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, very good technique for, for generating high gravity wort. Um, you don't have to do long boils, you don't have to add malt extract, you simply do, you know, two or more sequential mashes using the wort as the liquid. Got it. You do have a lot of waste. I mean, there's still a lot of ends up being a lot of extract left behind, uh, which you could then sparge with additional water to make a separate beer. That would be like a small beer that you can make from that. But yeah, great technique. Okay. It's in the book. <laughs> so it's also a John that writes in, and, and by the way, he's from the Maryland Ale and Lager Technicians Club. He's the president uh -huh. there. Um, nice. Malt course um so he's got he's got a short question and a long question they're really the same um he, he wants to know how does he treat the mash water for the second batch ah but well if i'm under if i could just say if i understood what you just said there is no water for the second batch there's just wort for the second batch that, that's right okay yeah <laughs> excuse me um yeah so you're you're mashing with that wort so the all your water adjustment was done on the first batch. Got it. Okay. Well, that was easy. Yep. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. Just do it in the beginning. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and when it goes, comes to water adjustment in general, um, go to chapter, what, 21, 22 in How to Brew, in the new edition. Look at the brew cube. And uh, that takes a lot of the mystery out of, you know, what it is you're trying to adjust when it comes to water adjustment. There we go. Easy enough. You can start out right. Um, okay. Here's another one. I found this one interesting. KJ wrote this in. He says, hi, guys. I'm KJ. Uh, I've been homebrewing for around nine years. Um, he says, I've searched for topics in Brew Strong over the years um, and just recently started a job with an hour commute, so I decided to just go back to the very first topic ever and make my way through the majority of the list. Uh, wow. Yeah, so he's listening all the way through, uh, gosh, over 10 years of shows with you guys. Yeah. Um, so he says, this led me to decide to ask a few questions. Uh, he says, through experimentation, um, I've found that adding things to fermenters post high Krausen achieves a brighter, more fresh flavor. Uh, he, says, yep. he says, I'm somewhat of a fanatic about sanitation. Um, I've done some prepackaged things like canned fruit and candy syrup straight from the package with good results. I've also done a vodka tincture with things like spices, cocoa nibs, orange peel, uh, and vanilla beans. Says, I'm curious, though, uh, of other methods of sanitarily adding things to a fermenter, more specifically dry items that clump up and would require stirring. Um, mm. You know, he, he gives some examples, uh, graham crackers. Um, he says, he's, I'm particularly interested in trying powdered cream cheese. <laughs> something that he's found. Um, uh, also, uh, fruit, um, and so on. So, uh, what do you think, John? How can uh, first of all, do you agree that uh, adding, you know, ingredients post Krausen uh, does g achieve a brighter and more fresh flavor? Yeah, because you're not scrubbing a lot of the volatiles from that addition out. Um, you know, adding them in before fermentation. Hmm. Um, things like coffee and, you know chocolate and certain fruits, um, yeah, you're going to end up using, losing a lot of the aroma uh, due to the CO2 scrubbing that occurs during fermentation. So, yeah, I agree with them there that adding them post um can help that. Okay. When I 
uh, do fruit beers myself, um, I'll often do a secondary fermentation. That is, I'll do the main fermentation with just the beer, and then again after Croizen or after you know towards the end of fermentation, then I'll add in the you know the fruit syrup or the fruit you know whatever form it may be in, mm -hmm. and essentially conduct a secondary fermentation of just that fruit, and that decreases the amount of loss of volatiles. Okay. All right. Well, then on to the, 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 the real question here. What about uh, sanitation with some of these uh, items that are more difficult to sanitize, like, you know, crackers or, or, uh, or powdered cream cheese? Yeah, crackers. Why the fuck would you use crackers? <laughs> well, he did specifically <laughs> say graham crackers, but uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, those things, well, crackers, any, any wheat or grain cereal kind of thing, um, going to be potentially fermentable, but generally, um, you're going to end up leaving some starches behind too. Mm -hmm. Starches can become food sources for bacteria. So even, you know, the, the only way you prevent that is really starting with a beer that's like, uh, I forget, I forget what the exact threshold is, but I think it's somewhere above 5% uh, alcohol where you, de you know, radically decrease the likelihood of bacterial contamination. The alcohol level is high enough to prevent that, even if there is like a starch source that they could feed on. Um and in general, that's going to hold true for like other fruits and fruit syrups and so on. Like if you were to throw a whole apple in there, you know, you'd have, you know, bacteria on the apple skin and so on um, that could potentially contaminate the beer. But again, with that alcohol level plus the hops in the beer are usually enough to, uh, to keep that beer sanitary, prevent bacterial growth. Okay. Um, going into strange things like powdered cream cheese, I think you're going to run into other issues, um, mainly because of the fats, the fats and the oils are, you know, any, any fats and oils you add to beer, uh, are going to reduce its shelf stability, its flavor stability. Yeah, they're going to stale. Um, they're going to generate, you know, soapy, fatty, off flavors, so I really don't think you want to do that. Even um, some of these uh, peanut butter beers where they use defatted powdered peanut butter, um, those beers don't have the shelf life of a, no, of a regular beer. Um, even though they've tried to remove some of those bad components, you know, the oils and so on, um, you're still, you still start running into flavor stability issues. Okay. So, yeah, um, High, after high croizen, if um, it's something that you are concerned about, you know, an ingredient that may have a higher potential for contamination or, say, a lower alcohol beer, then I would, and I would take that and add it basically to the whirlpool after the boil. Um, that way you can use the pasteurizing properties of the temperature of the whirlpool mm -hmm. you know anything above 160 degrees for you know 10 minutes or so will pretty thoroughly pasteurize anything um, and knock down your contamination issues um, but because it's after the boil you don't lose the volatiles that you're often looking for okay all right Good advice, and thanks for sending in the question, KJ. Yeah, good uh, question. By the way, as a reminder, you can send your questions into Brew Strong at thebrewingnetwork.com, and those go to Jamil and John Palmer, and they try to get through all of them for you, so don't be afraid to send in your questions. Um, how about one more before a break? Let's see. Tom writes in, uh, hey, thanks, uh, thanks for doing this show. It's been very helpful in my homebrewing adventure. And he goes on to say, I've seen that Fermentus has a new E2U yeast procedure, which you're going to have to explain to me, John. Um, 
he says, I rehydrate my yeast, so I'm a little skeptical. Is there some kind of new addition to this or non-rehydration, or is this just a selling point? Yeah, um, this is their new easy-to-use uh, line of ah. dry yeast. And this this product line has been coming on for a couple of years now, um, or at least you know they've been gearing up for it. They've been talking about um, that you know the improvements in dry yeast manufacturing production and so on um, in the last you know five ten years are such that um, you you have a much healthier uh, yeast cell going into fermentation, one that they have done uh, the the nutrient buildup the oxygenation, the aeration for you prior to uh, drying it out so that when you pitch it to your wort, um, that you don't need to rehydrate it first. You can just pitch it. You can take the dry yeast, pour it directly into the fermenter, mm -hmm. uh, into your wort, um, and that you don't need to aerate it because they did that aeration resulting in, you know, the sterile synthesis, the amino acid buildup and so on, all these things that yeast normally do during the lag phase of fermentation after you've pitched them, they've done that ahead of time. So now you can take this, this easy to use yeast, pour it directly in the fermenter, it slowly rehydrates itself from the wort uh, rather than pure water and um, is ready to go. Does very minimal growth, uh, physical growth that is, and taking in nutrients and so on uh, before it gets started reproducing and going into high fermentation. Okay. Now Tom adds, you know, that he's a little skeptical about this. What do you think, John? I've been skeptical myself right up I mean, right up through the present day. Um, the other yeast companies have also expressed a certain amount of skepticism. But, you know, uh, in theory, you know, based on an understanding of how yeast cells work, mm -hmm. it sounds doable. It's just a question of how well, you know, Fermentus or another yeast company can actually pull this off in terms of, you know, quality control, consistency, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, it's uh, not to compare it to Boeing or anything, but, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Too so soon. I, I, I think it is I think it is doable. Um, like, you know, yeast manufacturers have gotten a lot better at yeast processing in the last few years. And they're, you know, able to they're able to put more cells into a package hmm. with higher vitality, higher viability. So, um they, you know, Fermentus has documentation on their website that supports um, the performance of this yeast. So um, give it a try. Yeah. You know, I should give it a try myself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let us know. You know, I'm not going to try it, John. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the email, Tom. Uh, I appreciate that very much. Um, okay. How about we take a, a quick break and we'll come back and do some more questions. Alrighty. All right. Hang in there. You're listening to Bruce Strong uh, with Justin uh, Crosley filling in for Jamil and uh, the great John Palmer. Hang in there. We'll be right back.
to brew has never been so disgusting. This is Brew Strong. Now that one sounds more like me, John. Yeah. No, it's just the way you guys present it sometimes. Uh, yeah, I suppose that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. All right, well, uh, we are covering your listener questions here. Uh, once again, you can send them into Brew Strong at thebrewingnetwork.com if you've got your own questions, and we'll uh, cover them in a future episode. Um, for now, we've got one from Chris, uh, who he's got some questions about uh, brewing classic styles. And uh, oh. luckily, I think, John, you know that book well enough to cover for Jamil here. Indeed. So Indeed. he does say, hi, Jamil and John. I'm a relatively new brewer and have a simple question regarding the recipes in Brewing Classic Styles. Um, if a recipe, uh, for example, the Munich Hellas on page 52, has steeping grains in the extract recipe, do you still include these in the all-grain version? And so he gives a little uh, further on the example. So uh, the all-grain version of Munich Hellas is the following. Uh, if I- He lists it as the following if he should keep in the steeping grains, which would be um, it's about 4.5 kilograms of continental Pilsner malt, uh, 340 grams of Munich malt, and 113 grams of uh, melanoidin malt. So I guess mm-hmm. the question here is... Um, you know, is that steeping, that melanoid malt um, included if he goes all grain? Yes, it is. The way that we set up Brewing Classic Styles is that we traded out uh, the, the base malts for malt extract, either like pale malt extract, Pilsner malt extract, or Munich malt extract. Then when it came to the other components of the grain bill from the all-grain version, because these were all of Jamil's uh, all-grain recipes, um, they use various specialty malts. Mm-hmm. Um, then those specialty malts are steeped for the extract version. It Then it's all just mashed together for the all-grain version. So the all-grain recipe for the Munich Hellas is the Pilsner malt, the Munich malt, plus that 113 grams of melanoid malt, um, which I think is like, what, a quarter pound? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Something like that. Okay. All right, and I want to add on to this question, John. In the Sure. Uh, so on the extract side, um, what contributions are we getting from the steeping grains? Is it just color, or are we getting fermentables? Are we getting um, uh, flavor? What do you think? Yeah, well, you're getting flavor. You're... Generally, you're not getting fermentables. Okay. Um, and, and it depends on the specific steeping grain. But um, basically, if you can steep it, um, it has been processed either by heat or um, stewing, you know, making a caramel malt out of it. Um, all of the, the readily fermentable sugars and starches that could be converted are have been incorporated into say uh, Maillard products, these melanoidins and other flavor compounds, um, or they've been caramelized into non-fermentables. So, yeah, uh, even even your low color caramel malts don't really contribute much in the way of uh, fermentables. You know, all the all the fermentables have been converted into color and flavor compounds. Got it. Okay. Which could be dextrins, of course. Other, they're still sugars, but they're just not fermentable. Yeah. Now, and John, having participated with that book, uh, obviously, I, I have another question. How? And maybe this is kind of a silly question because I know you guys would only put out quality, but um, right. right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess my question is the extract version of these beers next to the all grain version. Now, of course, uh-huh. there's going to be some differences in flavor, right? But yeah. W- w- what do you? How different do you think that is? Are they pretty damn close? They really are quite close. Yeah. Um, and um, in fact, a couple of years ago, I I retooled some of the uh, recipes from Brewing Classic Style into my own uh, line of beer kits, which you can find at some brew stores around the country, um, Palmer's Premium Beer Kits. Nice. Um, and... You know, they're not going to taste exactly the same mm-hmm. as the all-grain version, but they are still going to be a good taste in beer that is rep- truly representative of a style. 
Which was um, the point of the book, exactly. Right? So, yeah, you know, yeah. The, uh, to to emphasize that, um, back in two thousand seven, I think, at the Craft Brewers Conference in San Diego, if you remember that one, um, Dr. Michael Lewis gave a really good presentation that really stuck with me, and uh, he was talking about you know as a brewer you make a decision every day when you brew. Am I going to brew the same beer or am I going to brew a different beer? And unless you do everything exactly the same as the previous brew, you're brewing a different beer. Now, it may be a very small difference, mm -hmm. but, you know, you change, you know, ingredient levels, you change temperatures, fermentation, pitching rate, all of these factors that go into, you know, the ferment, the brewing and fermentation of a beer, if you change any one thing, you've brewed a different beer. Right. So with that in mind, yeah, recognize that an extract version of an all grain recipe is going to be a different beer, but yes, it's going to be very similar. Okay. Well, and that's not even to mention that, um, beer is an agricultural product and so even exactly you know, the yield from year to year would make a different beer right yeah yeah so. that that's an excellent point too and that's when i bring up when i'm talking about uh, fermentation and maturation and um, so on that yeah it, you know this this barley variety versus that barley variety different flavors mm -hmm. this maltster versus that maltster different flavors in the malt you know, um, Brees's caramel malt versus Weirman caramel malt, the same, you know, relative color, color level are going to be different because they're grown from different barleys in different parts of the world, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, uh, we need to keep in mind that beer is an agricultural product and it's going to vary every time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that gets us through our listener questions for this episode, but I've got another kind of beer-related question for you. All righty. I'm looking for advice and hoping that maybe our listeners would, too. I know that over the last uh, several years, John, you have traveled uh, the world uh, to go to different beer events, beer festivals, judging, conferences. Um, so and this might be hard for you to do, but if, if I had one trip to take— in a, in a given year, what, what was, what was like your favorite, what, where should I go? Which of these festivals that you've been to, should I go to? Ah, uh, you know, <laughs> that's a great question. I, I, I've been going down to Mexico a lot for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, for, well, actually for the last 10, really. The Ensenada Beer Festival in March is definitely one of the world's great beer festivals. Cool. Um, the Ensenada, if you're not familiar with Mexico in general, Ensenada is about an hour and a half south of the San Diego border. Um, it's right on the coast, and it is um, well. All of the all of the the Baja California breweries have been, you know, brewing beer for uh, you know the last decade. Mm -hmm. uh, they have easy access to San Diego. They know American styles real well. Um, frequently do collaboration brews. I mean, these guys are uh, some of the best of the best of Mexico brewers. I mean, really, I mean, San Diego brewers for that matter. Um, they're top notch. Then you have the added benefit of being Ensenada, which is the uh, home of one of Mexico Mexico's uh, culinary universities. Oh, nice. And so you have incredible food being taught there in town mm -hmm. you have it's a seaside town they have great seafood they have the ensenada beer festival every year in march around the third week okay and so they set up with all these tents of brewers pouring beer um restaurants serving ceviche and sushi and all kinds of delicacies um and like three live bands playing, you know, great music. Wow. It's just an all day great party. Okay. So I always look forward to that festival. You have convinced me. That sounds awesome. <laughs> good. Like a good one. Yeah. And I've never been to Ensenada. I've been to several parts of Mexico, but never there. So 
Uh, yeah. It sounds beautiful. Nice town. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you have it, folks. And that's going to do it for our Q&A show today. Um, we will be back, of course, with more episodes uh, next month. And those, I think, John, we, we might be doing live from HomebrewCon, right? Yes, that's right. That'll be fun. Yeah. Always look forward to HomebrewCon. Yeah, me too. It's a, it's a very good time. Here. So uh, that's at the end of June. Don't forget to go get your tickets for BNA 14. You can get those at thebrewingnetwork.com. Uh, they're on sale now. And uh, you also, by getting a ticket, uh, you get a chance to win the More Beer official Brewing Network brew sculpture. So Excellent. I'll be excited to see who gets that. Um, yeah. All right, John Palmer, I will talk to you next time. Thank you so much. Bruce Strong, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bruce Strong.